Good afternoon and welcome to uh, Reach Out on this lovely Thursday afternoon. Uh, we are doing the second part of the dynamic assessment uh, webinar that we started a couple of weeks ago. And I'm so excited to introduce, we have colleagues here from Southwark and I shall let them introduce themselves and it's brilliant to have you with us today. So, hello, hi, I'm Marsha Douglas. I'm one of the senior EPs from Southwark um, and uh, Southwark in London. Yeah, but, and we, we um, are a service that um, are quite actively using dynamic assessment. Brilliant, thank you. Hello, I'm Jackie Knowles. I'm one of the educational psychologists at Southwark and I've been there since 2003. So I've mainly been using dynamic assessment Fantastic. Thank you very much. And this afternoon, we will be taking um, questions for a discussion around some of your questions. Um, you were really brilliant last time. You sent loads in. Please do the same. Use the chat button or the Q&A button um, as we go along and we'll try to answer some of those questions. Um, we had some questions from last time and I think one of them that Kate kept coming up was about reporting and feeding back information gained through dynamic assessment and I think Sarah's going to talk about that now um, linking it to the child that she talked about last time. Thank you Paula I'm just going to share my screen um, to get up the powerpoint. Okay so yeah, what we thought we'd do, because there was lots of um, questions and thinking around how we might feed back um, the, the dynamic assessment work that we do in schools. Um, so we thought to, just to sort of, again, keep that mediated learning language going, we'd bridge from part one to part two and use the examples that I gave and shared in the first one. So um, I'll just talk a little bit generally about how I write my reports and then um, Jackie, Marsha and Paula can chip in as well as things that they use and they write. Um, so what I um, tend to normally do with my report writing is do a quite short overview of why I use dynamic assessment, what tools I used and what things I was exploring using those tools and then about what we discovered from that work, the strengths, the areas for development, and also the mediation strategies. Um, so this is kind of just a quick overview of the, literally the words that I would write in um, my reports. Um, the examples that I've used here are partly from the child that I um, spoke about last on the last session but I have added some other information so it's not directly from their report just just to mix it up a little bit so I'm not sharing a, a whole report of a child um, so it's given you a chance to have a bit of a look through that and it'll obviously be on the YouTube video as well for you to read through so just quite a short but concise overview of, of what I might write um, don't know if anyone else writes anything differently or if that resonates with what you, you guys use yeah, it resonates and um, really important to try and keep the language as simple as possible. Um, one of the values is that your, tr your audience, you're trying to engage parents and possibly the young person as well. And so keeping the language really simple is, is quite important. And I can see that from what you've written. So yes, yeah, similar thing. Mm. And sometimes if um, you want to try and map it to what the concern is, so if say the concern is memory, you might want to kind of explain why you use that particular tool and what you were looking for regarding the language used in memory or the visual aspects of memory. And then you can also feed that back in, in your kind of summary in the report. Yeah, I think that, that ties in sort of quite nicely with the, the next slide, Jackie, going into, you know, why I asked um, Bob mm. in this case to, to do the simple figure drawing. Um, and in this case, um, I just showed the simple figure drawing when we um, looked at it last time, because obviously that's very visual to show you, but we did the lovely named children conceptual and perceptual analogical modifiability task too. I'm quite impressed I got that out in one go. Um, so yeah, so it's looking at those visual processing skills, memory and organisation, and um, all of those other 
um, you know, processes we look at when we do the dynamic, dynamic assessment work. Um, then um, I will go on and um, talk about the strengths. Uh, I think when I first started using dynamic assessment, I, I would write quite long reports, very narrative, almost about every step that we went through and lots and lots of information. And I think it's been over time and actually the tutorial training I went on that's helped me kind of condense it down a little bit to those key aspects of what I'm looking for and what I want to report back. Mm -hmm. And um, I also use a book that I'll show when we go back onto full screen, um, which is a Fraser Lachlan book, which looks at those um, cognitive functions that we look at as well. So I try and keep those in mind, which I've added there. Um, I wouldn't put those italic bits in my report necessarily, but I would think about those with the teacher and keep them in mind myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I found the David Thuriel, um way of writing things up really useful. He uses quite short headings, doesn't he? I think strengths was one, barriers to learning, um, and then next steps. Um, I use those quite a lot in my reports. Mm. Yeah. And we might add in like the mediational language that you might use to kind of uh, reinforce what actually happened in the process of supporting um, the, the assessment, you know, with the child. And so, yeah, it, it's best to try and keep it as simple as possible mm. where you can. Um, and like you said, having those things in mind. So you might have the structure in your mind that you're talking about vocabulary, memory, attention, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, when you're communicating, you're trying to give some practical links between what happened in assessment and what happened in the classroom. That goes back to the idea of um, some people actually see dynamic assessment as kind of quite complex and time consuming. And it is. But like anything, the more you do it, um, the more these things become kind of more fluent and, and yeah. easy to kind of think about, don't mm -hmm. they? Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I, I know I've been lucky enough to know Marsha for quite a few years now, and um, we've often had conversations about these these tests and, you know, it's bouncing those ideas between each other. And, you know, Paulie uses it quite a bit with me in Southend and having people to talk to and, and think about these processes with is really important, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah. So... Um, then yeah, with my reports, I'll then go on to sort of look at areas for development or consideration. Um, again, I try and avoid that areas of difficulty or, you know, needs type of language, try and stay with quite a positive language of description. Mm -hmm. So talk about the things that they benefited from, mm -hmm. um, think about the things that they might have found a little bit more difficult. And again, pulling out those things that we spoke a bit about last time around input it was you know their initial processing of of this particular task which was where they were getting really stuck mm -hmm. so uh, again using that type of language definitely yeah um, i like areas for development um because also it puts the onus on what other people have to do to help the child as well and um, so it's not within child difficulties yes they struggle with this but actually there are things that other people can do to help yeah. supporting that and then I think the next thing is what you were touching on a minute ago Marsha that idea around successful mediation techniques mm -hmm. um, so again keeping it very much in what we did in the space together um, and, and feeding it back and um, again looking at some of those effective um, elements of the learning so what motivate him using a color purple colour pencil you know and that that can be really important in the class you know making sure there's a purple coloured pencil for this child at all times yeah. So, yeah. yeah and I love the way when we report some of the dynamic assessment stuff that you are very aware of the approach to the task and the the effective side of it the behaviours and and the emotional um, response to the task and I think that's that's reflected really well when when you use dynamic assessment Definitely. yeah I would say so too and I think that the last slide I've got here is just about um the letters that I send to the children and young people themselves so this is something again I developed over the past couple of years thinking about how we include them and sometimes we forget we send the report and 
and um, we may not even include um, them. So that this is just, again, a bit of a mismatch of different things I've said to different children, but showing the visuals, I'll include their picture in it. And um, again, I think it was about a year ago, I sort of tried to decide which way my ego was going about including a photo of me in the letter or not. And I came up with the idea that actually, and there was more ego in thinking in just thinking the kid would remember who I was. So actually putting a picture in there as a bit of a prompt to remind them was better than just assuming that they would remember what had happened. So um, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's really nice because they might keep it and then they might not remember you, but then there's the picture to remind them. So I think that's a really nice touch. Yeah. I've had some nice feedback from the kids and the families about it. So, yeah, and I think it's... Um, and again, I think I use that kind of almost narrative approach, narrative therapy approach by the bit of a wondering question at the end. Sort of, I wonder how you can show your teachers all these strengths. Mm -hmm. So very strength based. So so that that's kind of just one example. That's how I, you know, some examples of how I feedback. I um, hope that's been of interest. I'm going to stop sharing now so we can come back and share some other thoughts and some other questions that yeah. you had with us. So don't, is there any other thoughts about report writing? No, lots of really positive feedback about the um, letters, Sarah, on the chat. So yeah. they've gone down really well. And I love the, the fact that you'd put the, um, the drawing in as well to yeah. show the, the successful part of the draw. Yeah. yeah it's really Most nice. children want to take the pictures with them. It's sometimes a bit of a battle to keep the pictures. <laughs> yeah. So you can take it. yeah. I, I know one of my schools were quite used to me going down to the photocopier because we'd go down and just photocopy. And that's the lovely thing about it is that if you use other tests, children aren't gleeingly wanting to show it off. But with some of the dynamic stuff, they're quite excited to share with others what they've done because you, you end on a successful note. And so they, they do feel proud about what they've done in that assessment. Yeah, that's what I really like about dynamic assessment is that they always end on a success, feeling that they've learned something during their time with you. But I really like your child friendly reports because I used to do lots of them. And then there was a time where probably when EHCPs came in, but they just kind of <laughs> we just ran out of time to do those things as much. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. Yeah. Yeah. I do as well. I suppose that kind of thinking about how we feed it back and that, that element of success from dynamic assessment, one of the questions that came through um, from Twitter actually was um, someone that's just starting to use assessments themselves in their work and they were sort of pondering on the differences between using psychometric tests and dynamic assessment tests and, and, and how that balances out. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Um. My thoughts around that is one that we have to be careful that we don't do bad psychometrics, good dynamic assessment, because I don't think it works that way. Um, and it always goes back to the question, what, what are you asking? What are you asking? What do you want mm. to know? And I think the power of dynamic assessment helps you to kind of make the links of the bit in the middle. So psychometrics looks at the out outcome. What can this child do at this moment in time? And it's quite static. Whereas dynamics assessment looks at how does this child get to this point? What strategies do they naturally use? And what strategies do you need to you know, share with them or make them aware of so that they can become, you know, extend their learning? And I think those are the key differences. And so it's very much around what question are you asking? Mm. Um, I'm always, always really intrigued as well, because obviously we do have medical professionals such as CAMS or uh, paediatricians that may want to use psychometric assessments and they, they go off and do these batteries of tests. And I'm always intrigued where I've gone off and done some dynamic that actually the strategies kind of fall in place. And I feel more reassured as a practitioner that I've done it in kind of a more child friendly, personable and interactive way that kind of reflects what might happen in the classroom. Um, so for me, I think those are the key differences that stand out. Mm. And yeah, it's, it's looking at what and how you help the child. And I think some of the best sessions I've done is where um, 
a member of staff like the Senko or the t or a TA or class teacher has actually been in the room and watched, observed Certainly. me doing the dynamic assessment because you you asked the question about report writing. I I we're we're all still developing how we write our reports to report back dynamic assessment. And I think sometimes when they see you doing it you can convey and you can even talk about things afterwards. You can say to the Senko, did you notice when I asked him in this way, he then kind of got it a bit more, um, which you can't always convey in a written report. So I think it's really nice if you have the opportunity to get a member of staff to kind of be there with you when you feel more comfortable doing the dynamic assessment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is really hard to convey in a report that would help the teacher. Um, but again, we do sometimes do standardized assessments. And like I was saying before, I find it really hard to do those assessments without mediating now, because I can see that by following a script, you miss so much. And if the understanding isn't there straight away within the child, you're gonna miss out on what they actually can do. Whereas with, when you have the opportunity to explain again, what you're asking from them, you can then really see what they're able to do much more organically. Definitely. You've just had a question on, um, does anyone, what informs um, a decision around using standardised um, assessments or dynamic assessment? Does anyone um, have any ideas on that? I think there are times when I do want to see what the child can do. And I mean, the, the most standardised assessment I tend to use is the Wyatt 3, where I can quite quickly I don't do I never I very rarely do the whole battery the whole test I just sometimes want to get an idea of what word reading they can do what some of their numeracy skills are spellings and I just use the yeah the quicker subtests sometimes reading comprehension but I don't think that's the best reading comprehension test but sometimes you do want to see what the child can do um, and it, it does depend on what the concern is what the teachers kind of need a bit of support yeah. with. And I guess sometimes when like information's missing, when the school haven't done their own assessments, so I really try to encourage schools to carry out their own assessments mm -hmm. in their normal practice and have that give some indication of what they already know. Um, for me, primarily, I think I do default to dynamic assessment. And I don't think it's my thought process, dynamic assessment, it always does go back to the question what am I trying to find out uh, mm. how does this child respond to a novel task are they organized do they plan things can they pay attention because the teacher's saying they'd never pay attention to anything so I'm trying to work out you know what the question was you know or what I've observed in class if I take them out into this environment and try something how are they responding to me what are the strategies that are going to help mm. them um so for me, that's how I think I distinguish which ones, like, which tests I'm going to use, which mm -hmm. I imagine is the same for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So very similar thought processes go through mm -hmm. my head as well when I get ref um, a request in and a discussion with this, the Senko. It's so what are we trying to find out and what have you done? So very mm -hmm. similar. I think for me as well, I mentioned it earlier, it's, it's been something about feeling more confident in my own skills at using dynamic assessment and there can be something quite safe about doing a VAS or a WISC sometimes because you did you've done the same pattern construction different tasks again and again and and it can feel quite safe and you know how to you know analyze the statistics and maybe come out with something but more and more I feel with using those tasks I'm not necessarily getting a richness of, of what's going on and certainly again around back to that mediation and finding out what they can do with a bit of help um, mm. I just find so much more information from it. Yeah we've had a question around um, can you use dynamic assessment to assess language skills? Has anyone... There's been quite a bit of research on speech and language therapists, haven't there? Actually, a lot of the, the kind of um, uh, published research does come from speech and language therapists. And I think it's, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head now of some details. Yeah, no, there, and there's a, there is a resource. I just can't remember the name. Hold on one second. 
quite recently published. Yeah. So there's dynamic assessment of language of learning by Natalie Hansen. Um, and yeah, it's a helpful resource primarily for speech and language therapists. But one of the things about dynamic assessment is about adjusting your, your mm -hmm. language and, you know, getting to the child's level. Um, some of, you know, like when you're doing the cat -M, you might be introducing them into using language actively whilst you're doing the assessment. So you want to see how much they can actually bring to the conversation. Um, and, you know, you'll get that information through consultation as well from the teachers and the family about how much language the child can use. There are some, there's the, um, what's, what's the one with the perception? I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Jackie. Is it Pam? Yeah. One that I can't remember what it stands for. Stands for. Yeah. But that looks at perception and language. And then also there's the um, the ACFS again, can't remember what the abbreviation is, but we can send that on the end. Um, but that looks at kind of language skills as well. Yeah. I think I think, yeah, most of the tests you can get an idea of, yeah, how you need to change your language, your instructions, the length of your sentences to, so that they can understand what you're asking them to do. And then you can also get an idea of their expressive language skills when sometimes even doing the CATEM, you can ask the child to explain their thinking or why did you do it in that way or how else could we do it? And, and then you can kind of determine their language skills from how they respond or how much encouragement they need to respond even if they're reluctant to. So I think you can kind of informally get a good idea of their speech and language skills through the yeah. assessment. Yeah, I think it ties in with another thing that, it was another question and another thing that we discussed between the four of us last week. Um, there was a question around how we might mediate with children that might be nonverbal or have mm. speech and language difficulties anyway. And we were talking about that flip side of it, that actually by using some visuals or using the just the shapes in the cat -M and modelling something, the children might not necessarily have the language to explain what they're doing, mm. but they might still be able to sequence the shapes. So yeah. you know that there's some processes going on there. So it, it's that sort of balance effect that, you know, a speech and language therapist or an education psychologist might be able to say, OK, this child's expressive language might be, you know, some delays there. But there are some good processes going on in terms yeah. of sequencing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. I think um, I'm, I'm just thinking about some children that um, are more reluctant to speak in front of a, a stranger which which mm -hmm. I am going in sometimes and and then thinking about um, using sort of dynamic assessment through an observation so um, asking them to work with the asking a TA to work with them or a class teacher someone they're more familiar with um, and then you can get a true reflection of sort of language skills as well so using mm -hmm. it um, via observation um, just asking a familiar adult to do a piece of work with the child and see what mm. helps and what what doesn't help as well can give give a truer reflection of some some of the children's language skills. Mm. Paula you hit on a really important point about the value of observation as well and um, so seeing children in their context you know how they usually kind of manage a classroom situation and sometimes I'll use the CAP, the Cognitive Abilities Profile, mm. as the structure of my observation to kind of pick out those bits around attention and language and, you know, how they problem solve and all of those types of things. Mm. So, yeah, observation can be really helpful. Yeah, and I think one of the questions we had earlier was around... Um, do we use classroom-based activities for dynamic assessment? And I, I certainly do, especially with the, the younger children, yeah. with the preschool mm -hmm. children, yeah. Yeah. So, in yeah. fact, one of my first visits back this September was where I asked, the same co actually volunteered to work with a, a year two child. And she had some really good sequencing and problem solving games that she did with the child and I was observing and I was kind of, yeah, using the, um, CAP framework to have a look at her cognitive abilities just through that observation and it was quite safe COVID wise as well <laughs> yeah I was uh, way over at the other end of the table 
<laughs> that, that reflects that a question that's just come in actually about how you do these things in a covid safe way and mm. um, it reminds me of a, another question that came through i can't remember if it's on twitter or um, the last time we did it about if anyone had used dynamic assessment virtually and I don't think any of us actually have but I did phone another friend and I've got <laughs> some tips um, from um, Isabella Bernardo who is a colleague now over in Portugal so she got in touch and let me know a few things that she's done and she has successfully used um, dynamic assessment virtually but she said it does need quite a lot of setting up so whether it's a parent or the adult that's there with the child, they will need the complex, uh, well, they'll need the sort of the paper there, the pen, mm. um, the resources there. And they'll also need to know things like if they're doing the complex figure drawing to take the drawing that the child's done away for the memory phase um, and just sort of be aware of maybe not to prompt for the 16 word memory task. So as Bella was saying, mainly the, the drawing tasks, the 16 word memory tasks are ones that you could do fairly easily. Mm. I think as Bella said, she'd put the complex figure drawing up on her screen so the child could see it and then draw it. Um, the difficulty was around obviously not being able to see the child actively draw the picture. Mm. Uh, I was saying that there was a way that you could get the other side to set up a, another camera that's right above a bird's eye and um, mm, watching yeah. the child do it. Um, and then there was some issues around, um, again, scanning the picture and sending it to Isabella. Um, the, the quality wasn't that brilliant, but I noticed earlier someone saying that they took photographs of, of pictures for, the, for them mm. to keep it. Um, which is probably a clearer way of, of doing it. So, mm. yeah, um, I think Isabella had found that, that you could do it. It wasn't easy and it, it took lots of setting up, um, but she, it's work in progress for her. I think she's still trying different ways. Yeah. So thank we, you. Have, we have had a comment. Someone's used it, the complex figure drawer via, via a video call and it worked quite well. Um, she angled the parent, um, the laptop, so they could see see what the child was doing. So some people have been using it out there, and again, yeah, using a bit of creativity. And I think that's uh, definitely the way forward. I think in some creative ways, we deliberated over it quite a bit actually, because we know that quite a lot of the families that we interact with might not have the resources to be able to set all of that up. Mm. Um, and that's not just technology, but just more generally as well. And so, um, yeah, we, we're, we're thinking about if there are other creative ways in which we could do that, but imagine that there'd be a lot of work that's needed in the background to get it up and start, start set up. Yeah, another comment, someone's done a jigsaw with a TA virtually. Okay, yeah. Um, and, yeah. And they use the cognitive and effective principles checklist while watching and then evaluated it with the adult afterwards, which sounds a really good idea. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely the route that we were going down. So that sounds excellent that someone's done that yeah. already. Yeah. Um, because sometimes you can do it by proxy. I mean, if you're observing a staff member, giving them the prompts of the kind of things to look at beforehand um, could be manageable remotely, I would imagine. Um, Mm. Yeah, I suppose it's having that conversation beforehand and, and discussion beforehand, isn't it? Yeah, we yeah. were concerned a bit about the ra establishing rapport with the child or young person. But if actually it's a member of staff that they know, that would probably help. I was also thinking about children where their attention span, a lot of the children we work with, they, you, you need to use a lot of kind of encouragement to keep them on task or to keep them with you and how that would happen virtually. But again, if it's a member of staff there that they know that would be much easier yeah. rather than a parent or they're on their own if they're secondary age. Because that yeah. might be a limitation, their attention, ability to attend to it. We've been asked, has, um, have we uh, ever used dynamic assessment as part of a staff training development or su supporting their evaluation of the intervention? So do, have we ever used it in, in sort of other ways rather than just assessing children? I think it's an um, interesting question. Yeah. Well, I guess only if they're, if they're observing us, I've only done, yeah, only if they're observing us carrying out a piece of dynamic assessment, but I haven't done whole class or whole staff team training. I, 
I did once in the early days um, and kind of felt I needed to go back and really research and understand dynamic assessment really, really well so that I could dissect the language because I kind of made the mistake of using all of the Freudstein language and it, mm. it, it just kind of went over people's heads. And so um, over the years, I've simplified it and broken it down. Um, but like Jackie said, probably impromptu where the, the situation arises and then you kind of exchange the background of why you're using the dynamic mm -hmm. assessment and what you're looking for. And in um, chat has said that they've used it in a multidisciplinary team meeting to show them the power and value of it. Um, we, we did some training, didn't we, Paula, where I did we do the 16 word memory task or something with yes, um, yeah, we got a volunteer to do it to again show them the the, the, the different elements of it and um, so that that's the closest we've done using it with adults apart from as you say having someone um, observe and then want to go on and learn more about mm. it I've got one of my senkos that's really yeah quite active look too I've actually um, learning and wanting to use it themselves which is really good as well mm. and that's the brilliant thing about dynamic assessment it's not a closed test like an IQ test or other standardized tests anyone can use it anyone can do it it's it's um it's it's just have a go and I, th I think um yeah to, uh, teachers it was a fantastic tool for them to use as well we're almost at time but there was quite a nice little question here on the um in the q and a's and i've lost it now it was asking something around whether we used standardized tasks dynamically because there's a, a little bit of controversy around whether to use things like the bass three or the whisk in a dynamic way so um i mean i did and then i stopped doing it and what i tend to do is when i've got to the point where a child gets to that ceiling and they can't do it anymore i will go back to the easier questions like previous age group and then i'll do it dynamically like that so it doesn't have any impact on the standardized score it's an easier one and it, again we end with that kind of sense of success mm. Um, if I need to, if the child's okay and we've just finished the task, then um, I don't always do that. Any thoughts from the rest of you? I Hands up, I have in the past. Um, I've not scored it um, and, and I've made it very clear when I've fed back that um, I, I've not done it in that way. But I do, I do think it can give you some rich information. But um, yeah, again, I've, I've tended to veer away from that um, sort of recently similarly although if if for example a school have done reading assessment a standardized reading assessment and I want to understand a bit more about how a child approaches reading I might use the standardized uh, text but then talk through it dynamically about what skills you know looking at those meta reading skills you know why why what did you think of this word and how did you decode that and that kind of questioning um to, to kind of unpick the language stuff especially because I find sometimes in the reading comprehension things it comes back down to language mm. and it's not understanding and that's the bit I want to understand are they able to kind of work out you know what meta reading skills are they using to help them break down information where do they need the support yeah similarly in um I had to do this, I had to mediate the numeracy part of the Wyatt three with a secondary school child where the layout of the sums was unfamiliar to her and she really got stuck. So again, I'll have to explain in the report that she scored this, but this is what I needed to do to get her to kind of get going with the actual part of the subtest. But like I said before, I find it really hard to do any tests now without mediating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely okay well I think we're we're about at the end I wonder if we've got go around and have any concluding comments I mean I've found it um just inspiring and great to see so many comments and just to discuss dynamic assessment because I really enjoy doing it and it's lovely to discuss it with with all of you out there and and here in the zoom room <laughs> Marsha any last thoughts 
Um, I've just found it really helpful just talking to other colleagues and I would encourage anyone just to try and get on as much training as they can and just keep on talking with people to get that support network because it does develop your practice and it develops over time. It's not that you're just learning and that's it. Mm. We're constantly refreshing as a team and access and training over and over again. So um, it's always good to talk. Yeah, no, I agree. And also um, the report writing thing is always, always a worry. So I don't think we've even as a service developed a really kind of way of writing reports that we're all happy with. So that's also something that you can really benefit from sharing with colleagues and talking about and saying, does this convey what I mean to mm. you so that you can kind of like improve in that area as well. Definitely. I think I'd just like to say thank you for to everyone out there that's put comments and questions. Yeah. They've been, it's been quite sort of overwhelming actually. It's been a fantastic response. So thank you ever so much and just echo what everyone else has said. Keep keep doing it keep keep discussing it it's great Brilliant. done it and you've discussed it come on and do a webinar with us and tell us all about it <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you everybody thank you marcia jackie and paula no worries thank you we're all well out there in these increasingly uncertain times again and we hope to see you all again soon take yeah. care everyone take care bye bye, bye, -bye.